Thank you all for taking the time to come out for this event. Let me first formally, respectfully acknowledge the Silks Okanagan Nation and their people, our partners in education, and in whose territory we are gathered today. And before I continue with my prepared remarks, I would like to take a moment to remember a colleague uh, many of you will have known, Wes Pugh, uh, who recently passed away after a lengthy battle with cancer. And I'd just like to take a moment for people to have an opportunity to reflect on him and on his contribution to this campus. Thank you. Wes was a very respected leader on both campuses of UBC, and he made a very important contribution here as our second provost. Um, he was famous for suggesting that we needed to have a sign made for everyone's desk in Vancouver, which on one side had their name and on the other that they would have on the front of their desk. On one side had their name, and on the back side it would say, remember the Okanagan. <laughs> Uh, he was more aware than any of how difficult it was to keep the Okanagan campus in mind when you were running the Vancouver campus. And we have musical effects today. <laughs> so uh, our Senate um, did recognize his passing. Uh, memorial was read at Senate and um, uh, condolences have been sent to his family and I've sent my personal condolences to his wife, Joanne. Uh, so let's look back over this past year. It has, as I always get to say, been an amazing year of significant change at UBCO. Not only the physical campus, but also in campus leadership and in some real milestones of our development as an institution here in the Okanagan. In September, we welcomed our largest class ever with more than 3,600 new students and a campus total of just shy of 10,000 students. This September, we know we will have more than 10,000 students on campus, and uh, it's hard to imagine that we began uh, only with 3,000 students, so it's more than tripling the population of students on the campus. You really feel it, don't you? It feels like now we're kind of busy. It's great to see the courtyard full of students. Um, but just days before classes began, and I have to say, phew, for that, uh, we reached a different kind of milestone, and that was the opening of John Hindle Drive. That had been on the books for the city of Kelowna for close to 30 years, uh, and it was planned as another entryway to this campus. So finally, we got it. And not only did we get it, even more amazing to me, we got a bridge. <laughs> Imagine our very own bridge. Uh, Vancouver doesn't have a bridge. <laughs> it's a game changer. It really is. I am so excited. Um, it has completely transformed the options that we now have for uh, transportation. It has changed the interior of the campus, pedestrianizing this area in the middle. Fantastic. Uh, one day that is going to be a beautiful plaza. It's in transition right now, but uh, it is going to be an amazing center for major outdoor events between here and Fipke and the Commons. In this, this coming fall, we'll be able to see the real impact of what these new kinds of options about transportation have, whether you're biking on the rail trail, whether you're taking a different bus route, uh, the new parking areas that we have, and we'll be able to understand uh, how much of a change that's making. And I think in the long run, as the transportation, the public transportation improves, um, we'll see even more change. I am, uh, I am rooting for us to have the equivalent of a Canada line between uh, Kelowna Airport and our campus. I made the argument to the city, uh, I haven't bought it quite yet, but it's a very short Canada line and it links to all the bus routes that run off our campus. And I think that would be just amazing. Uh, so back to more uh, serious on-campus matters. In September last year, we had the uh, real honor of hosting Grand Chief Stuart Phillip and of raising the flag of the Okanagan Nation on campus. I know many of you were there. It was a really emotional ceremony. 
uh, it was wonderful to hear our students explain in their Okanagan language what that moment signifies for them and what it means for the future of our campus partnership with the Okanagan Nation. We are eternally grateful for the foundation of that partnership. But raising a flag or the kinds of opening remarks that I make acknowledging the territorial rights of the Okanagan people are obviously not enough. And so we're moving ahead. Um, and we have a wonderful group who've been working as an advisory council to me on our response to the Truth and Reconciliation recommendations. Uh, the group has worked diligently for the last two years, and I'm pleased to say that the recommendations are uh, forthcoming. They are going to be presented to our board in June, and we will have uh, a public event and a ceremony where we will launch uh, in September probably around the time that we host the UBC board meeting here on campus. It'll be another opportunity to celebrate and to actually look forward as to the kinds of things that we're going to do, not just the ceremonial, but actually how we are going to move ahead. Now, also last fall, we welcomed someone very special to this campus, and I, no, I can't see her here, and I wonder if she's here. Ananya, are you here? Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry, no. Sure, and Anya is very busy. I was about to say she's been highly visible on campus. <laughs> and also secretly behind the scenes, doing all kinds of important things. And Anya is truly a dynamo. It's great to have her on the team. Um, some of you may have heard her speak at the equity, diversity, and inclusion event that we had recently. She spoke very movingly, um, and uh, I am delighted that uh, she has decided to join UBC Okanagan. Last week, something very special happened at the Board of Governors, and that was that the board endorsed our proposal to change the title of the provost here to better reflect that role as the chief academic officer for our campus. So up until now, our provost has been a vice principal. And it's a complicated story, but uh, a vice president is a higher level in the hierarchy and is recognized in the university legislation. And Ananya's title has been changed and she has become the provost and vice president academic for our campus. And this is exactly aligned and in parallel with the provost and vice president for the Vancouver campus. Now, we've come a long way from being a tiny startup of UBC. Our scale is still very different, but to have the importance of that role recognized on both campuses as equally significant and equally a part of the university executive team is a very, very timely change as we start to look forward to what we're going to be uh, in, our, in our future state. And so um, congratulations to Ananya on her uh, transformation to a vice president from a vice principal. So, a few other things that I'd like to mention about major events that have happened in the last year. We opened our space in the innovation UBC, we opened an innovation UBC hub, I should say, in downtown Kelowna, in the Innovation Center. It's an opportunity for us to be very present downtown and connected with the tech and entrepreneurial community. Last month, an enterprise, a startup venture founded by a UBCO management alumnus, Justin Goodhue, uh, earned $130,000 of angel venture capital at the Okanagan Angel Summit. He was the winner. His organization, his new enterprise, a spin-off from one of our students, was the winner at that program. Um, and I offer my heartiest congratulations. It's just the beginning of the kinds of things that will come out of this campus. And it's not the only startup, but huge congratulations to Justin and the team that have supported Trellis along the way. And I know that there were um, many academics who were behind the scenes as well. Perhaps the biggest news from last fall, um, and it's sy symbolic in many, many ways, was our first ever homecoming. It's hard to have a homecoming when you don't have many grads. 
Uh, we reached now more than 15,000 alumni from this campus. And so our DAE team, uh, led by Adrian Nolan, uh, organized our first homecoming. We had a um, great race on campus, uh, a lot of activities. The engineers, of course, had a Dunk the Dean event, which was very well received. Um, and we've learned a lot. So this year, we'll be doing our second ever homecoming. And I don't know, uh, are any of you uh, fans of the debaters on CBC? So Steve Patterson, who is the host, is going to be the featured speaker for homecoming. And he will be speaking at a dinner event. So dinner will be served, and Patterson will be speaking in our new 400-seat theater. So something to look out for uh, around about the September the 28th weekend. Very exciting. Um, and so now turning to this year, this calendar year, of course, the big news was that we opened the Commons building. And what a game changer that has been. Enormous crowd, and it's been fantastic to see the students filling it up. Uh, I don't know, I like, I park my car over here, and I like to walk now through, because there's a, there's a link, you can walk all the way through. Um, and I'm just delighted to see what's going on in there. Whatever time of day I walk through, students studying, the cafe, uh, it's just a great new space. And of course, um, the food options available in the Comma Cafe, I have to say their lemon bars are lovely. So. And that now makes me think of food. And uh, you may have also seen the news that we're bringing our food service in-house. For the first 15, 14 years of this campus, we've had Aramark as our food provider. But we're now big enough that we can uh, make a kind of a business case to run our own food service. It does, it does mean that we will be needing to provide more management. And I know that uh, Human Resources is stepping up in that regard, and shush, will be operating the food service here under the same model as is used on the other campus. So as we transition, our um, many wonderful employees who've been working on campus, but with Aramark, have the opportunity to apply for and become UBC employees. And they'll be joining our BCGEU group and will have access to uh, the UBC um, benefits and a better compensation package. And I know from speaking to some of my friends in the cafeteria that the idea of having a parking permit is quite attractive. So there we go. Uh, it's all good. Um, looking forward to the opening of food service on the 1st of July. Now, having spoken about the commons uh, makes me think of where we're going. And those of you who live and work in this building every day are no doubt painfully aware of the start of construction over here. And um, I apologize in advance because it's going to be another 18 months of <laughs> noise and dust and disruption next door. Um, but it's going to be a great addition. The Nechaco residents will have 500 seat dining hall. That will be part of our new food service. And just the other side, the construction has also begun on what is to be called the Skeena residence. And that's going to be our first building built to a um, vig rigorous, voluntary, energy-based standard and design known as Passive House. And what Passive House means is this is a building that will uh, require about 10% of the energy that a, another type of traditional structure building would require. So imagine if you know, your home heating bill was cut by 90%. That's what we're hoping to achieve with this building. It'll be the first building of that type and that scale built here in the Okanagan. And it's a little bit of us being a living laboratory for looking at new sustainable ways of thinking about living in an environment like this. It's not just heating, of course, it's cooling as well. So together, those two new residences will give us 400 more beds, 440. And that will mean we'll be able to house more than 2,000 students on campus. And that 500-seat dining room, which will be the other side of a courtyard that will be out here, uh, will be a wonderful place for them to have their meal services. So 
Those are the things that you can see going on. There are other things underneath and in development. And just to give you a heads up, uh, there's something which we call a plant growth facility, but you might think of as a research greenhouse. Uh, there will be new engineering design labs that are going in just um, east of the new Commons Library building, and that's to enable the expansion of the engineering program. We're doing renovations to the building we acquired at the, uh, it's called 1540 Innovation Drive. Um, that now has an official UBC name. As you know, all buildings at UBC have to have an official UBC name. This is called Innovation Precinct 1, and that's where innovative, eh? Imaginative. It gets better. There's more of those names coming in this little chat. Um, so that we're going to be putting part of our School of Engineering and the Faculty of Creative and Critical Studies in that space. That'll allow them both to have some high head space, which might be, you know, creative studio type space for arts and um, opportunities for partnerships with community groups and for our um, engineering program with industry partners as well. So that's very exciting and those things are coming on stream and you, know, you are seeing the beginning of the preparation of the sites for those. So let me talk now about our students. They're the actual reason that we're all here, um, even though now they're gone, I have a sigh of relief. Uh, not all gone, um, but they are why the campus is here. And I just want to uh, give a shout out to Jazim Nakvi, who was recently elected as our Okanagan student representative to the Board of Governors. This is a very important role, um, as it is the student voice to uh, the business side of the university. And also to welcome and congratulate our new student executive for the SUO, uh, led by their president, Romil Jain. We had an excellent meeting with them yesterday and my uh, leadership team. And uh, we have, uh, I have absolute confidence that they're going to lead on in the uh, same way that the team did this year. Uh, some of you know we have a person on campus called an ombuds person. Um, and this is a joint initiative between the Students' Union and ourselves. The Ombuds Office's role is to ensure that our students are treated fairly. It's sometimes difficult for an individual student to understand how to interact if they have an issue. Um, and we all know that interacting the wrong way makes issues get worse, not better. So uh, this year we've welcomed uh, a new Ombuds person, and I'm not sure if she's here, uh, Cindy Leonard. There you are. Hi, Cindy. I am delighted that you're here. Uh, Cindy is uh, a resource for students, of course, but she's also a support for faculty and staff who are working with students or who have issues that they are having difficulty dealing with. Um, and she's going to be working on uh, ensuring that we can treat all students fairly and that they have a place to go when they need advice about how to deal with their issues. Um, so thank you, Cindy, for taking that on. And I look forward to our, our occasional meetings as we go forward. Um, something else that's uh, a, an interesting development to me is that uh, the AVP students portfolio has launched um, a course. You don't often hear about the AVP students launching courses, but this course is called UBC 101. And it's an online course on Canvas that's available. It's not for credit. It doesn't cost anything, um, but it's an opportunity for students to actually um, uh, learn and orient themselves to the campus as they're coming on board. And in just the first month of it being available, 42% of the incoming class have actually taken advantage of it. So that's super, and that shows that there's a real need for this. Uh, the other thing that's become very uh, robust now and exciting is our co-op program. A year or so ago, we actually committed to offer co-op as an opportunity or some co-op or work integrated learning in other programs for every student on campus who would want to take it. So in the first two years now, uh, we went up by 51% from the first year to the second year in terms of participation. And we've had more than 250 students um, engage in uh, a co-op of one kind or another, with everything from not-for-profits not and SMEs to uh, governments, large corporations, as well as some of them working right here on campus. So 
I'm very pleased to see this. Some were quite skeptical that we could make this work here because we're in a small community. Um, but it turns out, of course, that students are quite entrepreneurial already, and they can often find jobs that are elsewhere. Uh, and at this point, I think it's a moment for me to just tell you a little bit about my own experience. Um, I was lucky enough to do a co-op undergrad program uh, in the previous century, I would add. And it was structured as um, three co-op terms, the last of which was 22 weeks. So, um, and the others were slightly shorter, but by the end of my program, I had, would have done three um, co-op sessions. I, um, I think I could tell you, actually, I, I started four, because I had the um, experience of being fired from my first. Now, not a good story to tell, really, but I got a job. I got a job, and I have, I'm telling it because it's a learning story. Um, I was uh, in my first year, and I was, you know, finding a co-op, and they sent me to work. I was given, and I was in an agriculture program, horticulture, and so the co-ops were um, all in agricultural type enterprises, and I was uh, assigned and agreed to go to a greenhouse operation. Uh, growing the kinds of chrysanthemums that are used very typically in, uh, you know, the, those little chrysanthemums, the stuffers that go in flower arrangements and in memorial wreaths and so on. Um, I hate the smell of them to this day. Uh, I think they're ugly. <laughs> it actually had a deeply wounding impact on me. And, and the reason that I was let go from my job, which was paying me um, just about 10 pounds a week because I wasn't yet 19 and I was paid under the Agricultural Workers Act, which meant that I got um, a wage that planned that I would be living somewhere on the farm. Uh, you know, it wasn't, a living, it wasn't a living wage. It was like 16 bucks. Barely paid my bus fare, actually. Anyway, I was fired because we were joshing around in the greenhouse and um, we were pushing, we were students. And um, I fell backwards into a chrysanthemum bed, uh, leaving one of those Tom and Jerry kind of marks <laughs> in the bed. So it was pretty obvious that someone had done a lot of damage. And uh, we were all punished. And I was um, with someone else. We were let go for, I think, kind of wrestling in the, or in the <laughs> greenhouse or something. Anyway, it was a lesson to me. I do not like working in greenhouses <laughs> at all, um, but I'm very happy we're getting one. Uh, my, I will not be working in it, I promise, I promise. I never have. All my work has been done outside on outside crops. Um, but I had the opportunity in that co-op to work in three good places for me, um, and they mostly involve work around orchards which is how I came to love being outside in orchards and so on. And in the third one, I was working for a co-op of fruit growers. And strangely, that co-op of fruit growers actually has a connection to the BC fruit growers, which is a, another agricultural co-op. And agricultural co-ops are very interesting enterprises. Have all kind, some of you, if there's any economists in the room, they have difficulties. Um, but they're big enterprises. I was working there and I was assigned to help the researchers from London University who were doing work with some of the farmers. And I was the worker bee. I was from the office at the co-op helping do this. And uh, I really enjoyed it. It was fun. And I got to work with farmers and fruit pickers and all kinds of other people and learned how to do experiments in the orchard. And that then led me to... Um, Go back. I went back for my last full year in my program, the, the honors year, and I had to buckle down to academic work. I had no idea where I was going, really. I'd had a great time. I loved my degree, but I had no idea where I would find a job. And it was, it was the 80s, it was the 70s. There were no jobs available in England. It was kind of miserable. And I got a call one day from one of the researchers and, um, saying that they had been given an industry partnership funding to do research on orchard management and physiology. And was I interested in being the graduate student who would do the work? Wow. And so 
I actually didn't have to think about finding a job uh, because I had a co-op PhD to go to. And uh, that enabled me to work in industry as well as at the university for my PhD. And I'm absolutely certain that that was what got me the job at McGill University as a professor. So in fact, the whole reason I'm here is because of co-op. That's the end of that story. Right. <laughs> so uh, back now to news and excitement from the campus. So I'm a huge fan. Co-op, if you have kids, just tell them that getting work-related learning is, is fantastic. And um, this year we have three of our students who were among the inaugural 11 students who received an IK Barber BC Scholarship Society Award. Uh, this is something new for us. Angelina Pinchbeck, Marley Russell, and Emily Medimer all received uh, these provincially funded awards, so kudos to them. And some of you may have noticed today that there are some quite small people on campus. Uh, we are hosting today what back in the day was called a science fair, but is now called the Central Okanagan School District Expo of Awesome. And that is underway this morning in the EME. We have some faculty and graduate students who are helping out with this. Uh, it's open to everyone. I'd encourage you to go have a look. Um, it is an opportunity to see uh, the work of more than a thousand students from kindergarten to grade 12 in our local school district. And they're working on everything from design thinking and uh, inquiry and presenting all of their, um, you know, I have recollections of building a nuclear power station out of a cereal box. So all these exciting things are happening over there. Now, the faculties. Of course, the students are why we're here, but we're organized into faculties. And there's great things happening right across the campus. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Alison Hargreaves in the Faculty of Creative and Critical Studies after she had won the Gabrielle Bois Prize for her book, Violence Against Indigenous Women, Literature, Activism, Resistance, which argues for a very important role of literature and storytelling. And she's a delightful professor. I am very, very jealous of the students who get to sit in her classes. Uh, she inspired me to go back and reread the first novel of Jeanette Armstrong, also one of our professors, written back in 1985 or published in 1985. It's called Slash. I highly recommend it to any of you who'd like to have an understanding of what it would have been like to be a young person growing up in the Okanagan as an Aboriginal person back in the 1980s. And our School of Education, what an amazing transformation and how fabulous their new program is, the extraordinary success of what they are doing. And our School of Engineering, also launching this year its new program in manufacturing engineering, which will start with students going into the second year of that program in September. And of course, that's why we're building some increased lab space. Our aim is that those students will eventually be able to use the digital learning factory as a hands-on learning facility about advanced manufacturing. In our library, our digitized Okanagan history project, this archive of all of the treasures of our region, now has more than 52,000 digital objects available collected from 23 participating archives and museums of the region. What an incredible, incredible resource that is for us, for our students, but also for everyone here in the Okanagan Valley. From graduate studies, of course, we have the ever enjoyable three minute thesis competition. Did any of you go to that? It was a fantastic event. Um, it was held downtown. And it was won this year by Cassidy Wallace, who managed in under three minutes to explain her thesis, which is on non-offending parental support and its impact on delays in reporting child sexual abuse. She earned $3,000 for an amazing presentation. Uh, we're seeing ever increasing number of students want to come to us for graduate studies. 60% uh, increase in applications this year. That's really important for this campus. That's a very important measure for us. And beginning this September, there will be new awards 
for Aboriginal entrants to graduate studies here. Uh, this is one of the ways that we are um, really working to make a difference. Uh, we will be providing an additional eight awards of $10,000 a year to Aboriginal graduate students coming in. And we're already, we'll be at, that is an addition to an existing eight awards of $10,000 currently available. So that will enable us to support 16 students on campus. Meeting our mandate for both the Okanagan nation and for the greater community here really depends on us having a very strong graduate program, providing people who are trained as professionals, as researchers and scholars, and it's really critical to us truly becoming the kind of institution that we promise to be. So on the topic of graduate students, um, just a couple of weeks ago, I had an opportunity to participate in the opening of a new research facility in the newly named Upper Campus Health Building, which many of you will be wondering what that is. And of course, it is really the Mountain Weather Office, but has a new name. Uh, we have an excellent, it's a fabulous building, by the way. I would encourage you to go visit. Um, we have health researchers from both Health and Social Development and the Barber School under the leadership of professors um, Kathleen Martin Guinness, Mary Young, Heather Gainforth, and Leslie Lutz. And they have extraordinary teams of research graduate students up there doing the kind of community engaged work that we know is really why we're all here. Uh, we had an excellent uh, celebration of research uh, with um, fabulous students and professors all winning awards. Emily Giroux as a student researcher, Katrina Plamenden, PhD level, Professor Rochelle Hole in health, John Corbett in the social sciences and humanities, Kasun Huwaje in natural sciences and engineering, uh, and congratulations to everybody who was involved in that. It was simply amazing. And Kasun has uh, another nice prize as well, and that is that he was named the inaugural recipient of a smart energy chair funded by Fortis, MyTax, and UBC. This position is for a five-year term, and it is designed to address in an interdisciplinary way the growing energy needs and sustainable use of energy in the province. So congratulations to Kasun. Is Kasun here? No? He does an absolutely amazing job. And finally, I'd like to congratulate uh, Professors Kyle Larson and Nellie Oki, who received uh, this year Killam Faculty Research Fellowships. Uh, that's not something that we have seen before. And these will have, this will give them each an opportunity to pursue full-time research while on a study leave. So that's a terrific opportunity for them to advance their research activities. Overall, research is up by an extraordinary amount. This year, we topped out over $22 million in research income and huge kudos to our research office and Phil Barker's team and the MITAX team for everything that you have done to enable our researchers to access support and to be so successful in grants. Now, let me turn to the future. Uh, you may have seen that earlier this year we engaged in looking forward to 2040. And some of you may have participated in some of those activities. Uh, in the past uh, few days, you may have seen some press about me presenting that information to the city of Kelowna. Rooted in the Aspire document for this campus and the UBC strategic plan, uh, it's based, our outlook to 2040 is based on our understanding of uh, where we are today, demographic projections, both locally, nationally, and globally in terms of demand for post-secondary education, changing in pedagogical methods, how we teach, what our students will be like coming out of the changing programs in the school system, and the very nature of work itself. We know that work is changing. The kinds of activities that we need people to do will change as more and more automation and artificial intelligence allow us to do a lot of things in ways that do not require people to be doing those routine jobs. 
So informed by that, we set out to consider what it would be like and what might UBC Okanagan be like in 2040. And so here's our projection. By 2040, this campus will likely have a community of 20,000 people here, including 18,000 students and 500 tenure-track professors. It will offer a comprehensive range of academic programs across the sciences, arts, creative disciplines, and professional fields. And it will have very synergistic academic links with the Vancouver campus. UBC will be world renowned for its partnership with our host Okanagan Nation and will be a leader in Canada in the proportion of indigenous faculty and students. And I hope Phil is here still. We will have annual research funding of $100 million and a continued commitment to research and scholarship and creativity across all the disciplines and in partnering with the community to make our research and innovation into practice for economic and social development. We're today a young campus of a global university with enormous impact. By 2040, we here will be really making that impact real right here in Kelowna. It's a very exciting time to be here. Uh, I presented this at the board, and it was unanimously endorsed a couple of weeks ago. It was presented to our external community advisory council, who actually questioned whether it was bold enough. It was welcomed by the city council earlier this week, and wherever we go, we receive uh, endorsement and support for the idea that we should dream big, that this campus can have impact, and I would argue that the best thing for this region is to have a truly global university. A global university that can allow the Okanagan, Kelowna, and the other cities and regions that we serve to actually have research and innovation at its heart in everything from the creative arts to healthcare to tech to aviation. All of this we should have right here. So it's pretty, pretty cool, actually. It really is. It's very exciting. Uh, the pictures that you can see up there, and I know this is never a good room for looking at slides, but what you see there is actually what the campus looks like today and uh, modeled out what the buildings would look like if we go as far as we're suggesting we go in the plan today. Uh, that keeps all of our development within the existing framework of what we consider to be our academic and innovation precinct space. We're not going on to any undeveloped agricultural land. It's a very contained, compact development. And as we cross the mark from being 9,960 to 10,000 students, I feel that we're actually into a launch. And the momentum is just going to gather as we go forward. Um, as I say, I'm entering the last year of my term here. There will be change and a new DVC coming in a year. I want to thank everybody here for all the work you do. Every single person who works on this campus contributes to the kind of university we are, to being a great university to having a beautiful campus, to serving our students well, to respecting one another, to being a kind place. And that is exactly the kind of university that we aspired to be back in 2012. I feel we're moving in exactly the right kinds of direction. There'll be lots of bumps. But it's been an absolute privilege so far to be part of this, and I could not be more excited today uh, than I've ever been. This is just an amazing time, I think, for us to be UBCO, and you all deserve huge kudos for making it happen. So thank you. <laughs>